The earth is our mother. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the sons and daughters of the earth. Water is not just another substance. It is a precious force that creates and gives life. In today's modern world, water has been taken for granted and we've lost respect for it. It's so fundamental in our lives that we rarely pause to consider its existence. Every day we drink it, wash and cook with it. But in reality, few people spend much time seriously thinking about it. A profound water crisis is now confronting the Earth. Dramatic signs of the crisis have emerged within the United States. Furthermore, there is no place within the U.S. where the evolving crisis is more evident than in the American Southwest. The American Southwest epitomizes the scope and complexity of the global water crisis. Within the United States, the subtropical dry zone is expanding northward, and the effect of that expansion will be an increase in frequency and intensity of droughts in the southwest region. Because of climate change, because of extreme weather, there are growing crises uh, in water in the southwestern part of the United States when there's a real question as to whether or not Lake Mead uh, will in fact be viable in another 20 years, whether or not the Hoover Dam will be able to generate electricity. These are all institutions that young people grow up expecting to always be there for their entire lives, but they very well might not be. The region is experiencing a steady decrease in mountain snowfall, lessening the deep accumulation of Rocky Mountain winter snow, which melts each spring and provides the Colorado River with its vital source of water. The bottom line is there's only so much water in the Colorado River. And I think right now the Colorado River provides water for something like 30 million people. It's, it's really not that big of a river compared to other rivers. The Colorado River uh, today is already a, a stressed river, and I think uh, the water demands that are projected on the Colorado River are going to outstrip the amount of water supply that we have available in the Colorado River. This could cause potential chaos in the seven states which reside within the river's watershed. Those people are going to have to find water somewhere else or reduce the amount of water that they use for various activities. The big users of water are the energy industry and agriculture. And so if the Colorado River flow decreases, which it will during sustained droughts, probably the effect of, of this stress on the water system will be a, a change in agricultural and energy practices. Today, the ongoing drought has brought the flow of the Colorado River to its lowest level since measurements began 85 years ago. It's anticipated that the current drought condition will result in a reduction of between 10 to 40 percent of water flow. We're in a drought right now in the southwest, but we've seen worse droughts in the historical record and the instrumental record and the paleoclimate record. Droughts that could make current arguments and fights over the Colorado look like nothing. Uh, droughts that could, could really cripple the entire region. This is not the first time a drought has affected the lives of people within the Southwest. A mega drought occurred 800 years ago and caused tens of thousands of Native Americans to abandon the areas where they lived because of a lack of water. And yet, we're not planning for that. We're not thinking about what that means. Uh, we're not fully prepared for the kinds of droughts that we could see in the Colorado. Today, the river is two degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it was in 1976. 
and is projected to increase in temperature within the next few years. When such a vital source of water warms, there are serious human health implications. If we have temperatures rising in the atmosphere, that's going to create a rise in temperature of the water. Uh, additionally, if we have less water, it warms up more quickly. And just from the direct impacts of having warmer water makes it a better environment for invasive species to occur at higher rates. This increase in water temperature will exacerbate the existing pollution and runoff issues which have evolved as a result of rapidly expanding urban growth and irresponsible human behavior. It could well lead to poor water quality, which already includes poisonous chemicals and pharmaceuticals. Also in the southwest, some of the flash flooding or stormwater problems, they're not frequent, but when they do occur, they can send a slurry of toxic substances to the watershed downstream. These things might be high in nutrients or in contaminants that are going to have an impact on the environment. So that will damage or hurt organisms that are living there and cause ecological damage. There also can be direct impacts to humans because when we have more people living in it, there's usually things in that water that are dangerous to humans. This we know. The earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. This we know. All things are connected. The Colorado River watershed is intricately connected to the world's ecological system, which transcends city, county, state, and national boundaries. Everything is connected to everything. Today, the world is faced with a serious water crisis. Currently, 1.2 billion people do not have access to clean drinking water, and twice that many do not have access to sanitation. It has been projected that by the year 2015, nearly half of the world's population, more than 3 billion people, will be in environments where pure drinking water will be difficult, if not impossible, to obtain. To compound the problem, the impact of global climate change, disruption to traditional weather patterns, increasingly severe droughts and floods in many parts of the world is already being seen. Water in the United States has always been taken for granted. The only time I think people understand the importance of water is when all of a sudden they don't have it. And I think that as we get into water shortage situations, that's when people will awaken up and start understanding uh, the importance of water and the fact that without water there is uh, no quality of life. Today, the average American uses over 100 gallons of water a day. More than 15 times that used by most people in developing countries. Americans use almost twice as much as Australians and eight times as much as the British. Throughout the 19th and well into the 20th century, the doctrine of manifest destiny mandated that the West be subdued and settled. The land was desert or semi-desert. But instead of adapting to the new country, the settlers and the government altered the ecology of the Southwest. We built an enormously complex water system in the western U.S. precisely because we don't get water where we want it or when we want it. Uh, precisely because the places that are growing the most rapidly are arid, dry, water short regions. And so because of that, we've built dams and infrastructure. We built aqueducts thousands of miles long through uh, very dry regions to move water from one place to another. As the Southwest is the fastest growing, most vital part of America, one of them anyway, and uh, they're not going to give up. 
I mean, they're going to use the water until, you know, hell burns over and uh, they're going to grow. Currently, Nevada and Arizona are the two fastest growing states. And following not far behind are Utah, Wyoming and New Mexico. Let's be honest about growth. Growth is going to happen. Whether it's because we multiply ourselves too quickly or whether it's because people move here because the jobs are created. Growth is going to happen. And it's not whether you grow, it's how you grow. How is this country going to absorb that growth if it doesn't come up with different ways of growing? Throughout the history of the American Southwest, the struggle over water has gotten more and more heated. Mark Twain was prophetic when he wrote about the Wild West. Whiskey is for drinking, and water is for fighting over. The conflicts over water in the West are legendary, and they're legendary because this is a region that's water short. So we do a lot of fighting about water in the West, and uh, I frankly think uh, that uh, that's probably going to continue. Political conflict over water in the West is an ever-present part of the scene. Uh, city versus city, city versus farm, urban versus agriculture versus the environment, upstream versus downstream, uh, vegetable growers versus cotton growers. Uh, and as long as we don't manage water sustainably, we're not going to eliminate those conflicts. Colorado uh, may right now be uh, over allocated and uh, it may be that it's going to lend itself to a big fight sooner than people thought and uh, there's going to be a lot of, uh, of weeping and gnashing of teeth because there isn't going to be enough uh, Colorado water. In the 20s, the government established the 1922 Colorado River Compact and the subsequent Boulder Canyon Project Act of 1928 which divided up the river to those within the watershed, which are the seven southwest U.S. states and Mexico. One thing that people uh, need to know is that when the allocations of the Colorado River were made, they were based on assumptions that we now know were uh, overly optimistic in terms of how much water would be in the river because they were based on some historical data that at the time they didn't realize, but now we know was pretty wet period of time. Also, the decision makers utilized population figures from the 1920s to establish the allocation of water. They did not anticipate the future growth of Southern California, Nevada, Arizona, Utah, and New Mexico. In the agreements, the state of Nevada had the historical misfortune of receiving a small share of Colorado River water. For an example, the state of Nevada was allocated 300,000 acre feet of water compared to 2,800,000 for the state of Arizona. When no one back in the 1920s was envisioning that you would have a behemoth uh, kind of city in the way that you do now with Las Vegas that is uh, huge and growing and uh, consuming uh, an extraordinary amount of water. The assumption that Las Vegas can grow as much as it wants, that Arizona can grow as much as it wants, that Southern California can grow as much as it wants, and that, that we will continue to find new sources of water, uh, that assumption's wrong. Uh, those days are over. Las Vegas receives 90% of its water from the Colorado River. Today, its population is now 2 million people and is now racing to find alternate sources in order to accommodate the demand. Reuse and conservation are the centerpiece of the Las Vegas water strategy. Can I help you? Oh! Oh! We're a community that's 100% recycled. So if we get water into our sewer system, we reuse it, either directly or indirectly. And we're a community that uses most of our water outside, just like every other Western community does. So we began to pay our customers a dollar per square foot in 2003 to replace their grass with drought-tolerant landscaping that's more sustainable 
in these desert environs. A couple of hundred miles west of Las Vegas is a region that faces even more extreme challenges. Every source of water coming into Southern California from afar is under environmental stress and is increasingly unreliable. Historically, Southern California has depended on two primary water sources, which are transferred from great distances. These sources are now becoming increasingly limited, and the effect could be profound. It's hard to tell people in California that where two-thirds of the population lives, uh, there is very little water resources. The system was designed to serve a population of 20 million and now must support 37 million, with a future projection of 60 million Californians by mid-century. The Sacramento-San Joaquin River Delta system which is the linchpin of the plumbing system, where the two rivers merge. It allows us to bring water from Northern California to the Central Valley into Southern California. Is really, I would describe it as being strained to the, the maximum. There is a growing concern that in the future, the ability for this important aqueduct to provide water to Southern California will be increasingly limited. Water and energy are intricately linked. A lot of people don't realize how much energy is used. 19% of the electricity in the state of California is used for treating or moving or heating water. And so when people are saving water, they're saving energy as well. That's particularly important as we start uh, to get serious about reducing global greenhouse gases. Because of the relentless drought, hydroelectric power throughout the West could also be in jeopardy. As energy demand increases, so too will the demand for water. Some speculate the electricity generated from the Hoover Dam could be in jeopardy. Well, and we didn't anticipate this. You know, we expected those reservoirs to be full. Uh, we expected to be able to use hydroelectric power generation uh, as long as the dam stood there. It didn't occur to us that the reservoir would go dry and we wouldn't be able to uh, generate electricity from that water. So this is, uh, this is one of the consequences of of the changes in, in climate that we're seeing. California is the number one agricultural state. It supplies many of the fruits and vegetables and other related products throughout the US. The agriculture community is also threatened by climate change and drought. So we may have created an unsustainable farming culture in some of these arid areas. And those areas in which we developed the irrigation for agriculture were based on the assumption that that water would be available long term. It may not be. There is conflict between agriculture and the urban environment. As both the agriculture community and the growing metropolitan areas make increasing demands for water, there is the potential for geopolitical tension. The central issue is the limitation of the essential resource, water, in order to meet these demands. Well, it's a challenge and it's a political um, a conundrum of sorts uh, because you know, the classic um, human nature is people want to have it both ways. I mean, they want, to, they want to be able to have accessibility to places that they want to live in, but they're not always places that are necessarily uh, the best from a standpoint of water supply in terms of other resources that you need. Population growth 
is also affecting groundwater resources. Clearly the growth in population is going to put new strains on our ability to uh, uh, to grow many of the communities in the southwest. Uh, it's an arid part of the country at any rate and uh, we are using up the underground aquifers that uh, many of those communities depend upon at a pretty rapid rate. Part of the problem is that there's a serious lack of scientific knowledge about how groundwater resources are being depleted. We don't have a good understanding of the water inventory, especially when it comes to groundwater resources. We know a little bit about how the aquifers function, um, how they're connected, but we don't have a really good feel for how much water we actually have. And a bigger point that we don't understand is how much water is actually going back into the groundwater. And the surface water and groundwater are two parts of the same system. So as the surface water uh, disappears, there's an increased use in groundwater, and so we're essentially mining water, water that will never be replaced. And so this is non-sustainable uh, development. Many growing areas within the American Southwest depend upon groundwater as a primary source of water. Well, uh, aside from the, the natural effects on the ecology, the, the, environment, the natural environment where plants and animals are having to survive through longer periods without water, uh, the human impacts on agriculture and water supplies for uh, cities and, uh, and other areas uh, are also being affected. One of the fastest growing and thirstiest areas in the U.S. is Palm Springs, California, whose primary source of water is groundwater. In recent years, there's been a shortage of billions of gallons of water from the aquifer which serves this desert oasis. Evolving urban expansion has pushed far into the desert and the Palm Springs environment could be in danger of drying up. In my region, we're the, I think the third fastest growing county in the country, and I think people have sort of overlooked this issue. In my discussions with our, our water agencies, they, they say that they have planned, but I don't necessarily know that they've planned as well as they need to. Desert communities, which were once considered rural outposts, have grown more than 50% since the year 2000. And the population, now 400,000, is projected to hit 1 million by 2060. The area's golf courses utilize 32.5 billion gallons of water each year. And that too is mostly groundwater. The pumping of water has caused the level of the valley to sink as much as one foot. Palm Springs gets its name from the aquifer that we sit on top of, but we do have to recharge that aquifer and recharging it comes from the Colorado River. So we're still dependent ultimately on the Colorado River, which it really becomes the source of life for us all. Another area experiencing enormous growth is Arizona. Phoenix now has a metropolitan population exceeding four million. The Phoenix area has a sophisticated and secure water source the Central Arizona Project and the Salt River Project. This system has been created at the expense of the rest of the state. In the state of Arizona, a large majority of our water supply is flowing into the greater Phoenix area. It's this giant straw that's just slurping up whatever is available. Water flows downhill. And under Arizona water law, and it's this way in, in many of the states, the people that first put that water to use have the water rights. Upstream, uh, you have communities that are now growing. They're in beautiful parts of the state, uh, like the Verde Valley, the Prescott area. And ironically, even though it rains and snows there a little bit more, 
the ability to collect that water really doesn't exist. The water rights are really downstream and they've had to rely on uh, aquifers, uh, groundwater that is being depleted. And that's repeated all throughout the, uh, the arid southwest. Groundwater depletion is a significant concern and it's having a direct effect on the integrity of the rivers within Arizona. In Arizona, we've been pumping groundwater out of the central basins in the state for almost 100 years. And we're seeing individual private wells being drilled all over the countryside, um, dewatering individually not very much water, but collectively having a big impact. Groundwater depletion is also a major concern in the state of New Mexico. My home, home state of New Mexico, uh, there's a living example of the Rio Grande, but it isn't the Grande River. It's a very, uh, it doesn't have a lot of water. New Mexico's Rio Grande, important and endangered, has been a source of water for the city of Albuquerque. It provides flood control and furnishes irrigation water to the agricultural community. Adjoining the city of Albuquerque and adjacent to the Rio Grande is the new evolving city of Rio Rancho. It's projected to be the same size as Albuquerque soon and it generates its water source from pumping groundwater, which threatens the Rio Grande. We're very concerned about flows in the Rio Grande. We have projects there that operate, and there's endangered species issues. Uh, and to the extent you're affecting surface flows in the Rio Grande, uh, you're having impacts on our projects and our water deliveries to our water users in the Rio Grande areas. In order to mitigate the groundwater problem, the city of Albuquerque is planning to import water from the Colorado River. This will make Albuquerque as dependent on the endangered Colorado as Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Phoenix, and the other growing cities within the Colorado River watershed. Do not hurt your neighbor, for it is not him you wrong, but yourself. Due to the evolving water crises, the communities with the greatest vulnerability are the Native Americans. Well, every morning, you know, every morning at dawn, we pray. Then the second thought is, do we have enough water? Should we haul water today? And it, how long will this water last? My concern is that we're going to have Native communities who are really going to be looking at a time when they're going to have their water resources drying, dried up. There is no physical infrastructure to get water to many of the dwellings of uh, people, for example, on the Navajo Reservation, uh, same thing with electricity. So there are circumstances uh, in our own country which are uh, in other, in other uh, parts of the world what we would think of as third world conditions. There might be not enough water to go around. It's just getting drier each year. And so we have to, um, we don't have any running water in our home. So we have to go elsewhere. Like I live about, what, 10 miles away from here to get water for drinking, cooking. Well, so far we haven't had any rain yet. And yeah, it's been dry. I mean, it's been dry. Well, um, the aquifers are down. There are certain wells uh, that, that 
the community whales, they're, they're no longer, they, they dry out. You know, uh, my family still uh, cleans out the water hole in hopes and prayer, uh, praying for rain. We have about, um, estimate is around about 80,000 people who haul water. And the watering points are, are from aquifers or we pump our water. And the amount of water we use compared to the rest of America is, is not much. People that do haul water use about 10 to 15 gallons per day compared to about 160, even 200 per day in most American towns. Sometimes the water that we believe is safe, then we find out that it's not safe. And it causes health issues. The, the people have yellow teeth because of the water. There's birth defects, there's other areas where people are, have skin problems as a result of drinking and using water. And children get illness, so the healthcare cost goes up because we are not using um, treated or quality potable water. It's kind of hard keeping kids, the little ones, clean. I mean, especially going to the bathroom and telling them to wash their hand, and but we have to pay for the shower. And um, sometimes, I don't know, it's like, why should we have to pay to shower? We take our Hopi baths like that, putting water in the tub, putting the kids in the tub like that, but not too much water because we know that water is really scarce right now, so. Because right now, the quantity of water that's coming out of the ground is barely enough to meet the demands in the area. So it's really hard. That's why we, we haven't been able to build the little mini mall, the little hospital that they wanted. We haven't been able to build, you know, new, the new school and all that because of all this. So. There's a housing um, development that was done and they look like they're, they're very nice homes but they sit empty because the water source isn't there. And from what I understand, the, the projection was there was water and then when it actually was built, then the, you know, the wells dry up. And according to our stories, you know, we, we, we've been put here for a reason and, and for a purpose. And part of it that is that, you know, we are to be very industrious. Uh, although this is a harsh environment, a lot of our life depends on the self-sufficiency of our people. You know, everything, our whole life is around the, how much water we have. On January 6, 1908, in Winters versus United States, the Supreme Court established a right to water to support federal reservations, including all Native American lands. The landmark Winters Doctrine was a promise to provide water for all Native American reservations throughout the United States. Well, I think the Winters Doctrine, I've always thought that if you, if you can have real water instead of having water on paper, it means a whole lot more. It's just as simple as that. Uh, in the case of Indian tribes, it's not enough for them to get what they call paper water. They want wet water. In other words, rights that are translated into programs or projects frequently funded by the federal government. Currently, efforts are being made to implement water settlements and provide infrastructure to the Native American nations in order to deliver this precious resource. There are numerous projects in the planning process. Two of the projects awaiting funding in the Southwest are the $1 billion Navajo Gallup water supply project and the $17 million Eastern Navajo water line. These projects will also be dependent on the endangered Colorado River and its tributaries. Let us put our minds together 
and see what kind of life we can make for our children. We have to have, at the national level, land, water, air policies uh, that reflect the danger to our country and to the planet. And if we don't, uh, then we will look back at this as a point where we had a chance to do something about the greatest threat to our planet, and we ignored that opportunity. I tell you, I believe the water crisis is much more significant to the world than the energy crisis is. You know, if, if, you had, if we had to go back and live without electricity, we probably could. Try go back and living without water. Doesn't work. In order to confront the crisis and avoid a catastrophe, a dramatic paradigm shift must take place within all facets of society. It is essential that the United States be the leader. You cannot preach temperance from a bar stool. For us to be leaders, we must show leadership. We must put in place a plan. Then and only then will the rest of the world listen to the United States. But uh, I do believe the federal government's going to have to play a much bigger role as a partner, not a dictator, uh, in helping the Southwest uh, because we have problems that cannot be so solved easily. They're very expensive and, and they can't be solved by cities and counties without big time help. My constituents don't necessarily understand nor all believe that there's a crisis looming. And it's hard to get them to buy into saying, you know, look at this problem on the horizon, we need to do something about it and address it. Clearly the federal government can do much more than it has historically. And I think it can do a lot to, uh, to help states and local officials to understand uh, their, both what their, their water resources are, but what uh, is likely to happen to those resources in the future. I think our, our role becomes uh, helping local entities uh, maybe on a basin-wide basis because rivers don't respect state boundaries, they don't respect local jurisdictions. They're, they're, many of them are interstate and there's broader implications than just the state and I think the federal government and the Bureau of Reclamation can provide a role in looking at the water issues from a macro perspective and helping local entities find solutions. Recently, all the major users of the Colorado River signed an agreement to drought sharing guidelines. This is a prime example of how partnerships can function. If you take a shortage and you spread it over a much larger base, everybody's proportionate share of that shortage is that much less. And the person feels that much less pain. We can get through it if we share it equitably. We can't get through it if we try to take all our shortage and dump it on someone else. It is essential that a national water policy be created and implemented as soon as possible. It's incredibly important. I mean, we have no water policy at all, no nationally mandated water policy at all. We have national standard setting. We, ha we know what our contaminant levels are supposed to be, but that's not the issue. The issue is when you develop new water supply, it's, it's fragmented. It's different in every state and even further than that in every county and city that you work in in the United States. It makes no sense. It must include a partnership and coordination between cities, states, and Native American nations. It is in my opinion, the single most important aspect that we can ask for right now. Uh, and and I, I think the federal government sometimes misunderstands that, that. They think that a federal water policy means federal water funding. That's not what I'm talking about. It is imperative that we have consistent regulations that allow us to develop, develop water supply in the most efficient manner, and that can only be done by having a national water policy. This water policy, in concert with strong and effective environmental land use planning, would be the centerpiece for decision making in order to confront the evolving crisis. In the past, water has been transferred throughout the Southwest without understanding the environmental impact consequences. 
So we're modifying the hydrology of these regions at a very big scale. And as we mentioned, we often don't even know what the initial condition is. We don't know how much water we have to begin with in some of these places. So to be moving it around without a big picture plan on how this is going to impact either the environment or how it's going to impact these communities in the future is, is dangerous. Conservation and effective environmentally sensitive water policy and land use planning are critical in order to protect our very limited water resources. For example, water used for agriculture can provide an alternative source of water in times of drought when urban supplies are insufficient. And government uh, could also help in terms of uh, providing uh, demonstration capabilities on uh, water sharing between agriculture and municipal users. 85% of the water in my state is actually consumed by, uh, by agriculture. And so water sharing uh, arrangements between agriculture and municipalities uh, might be a way of, of the future. However, this requires understanding, flexibility, and environmental planning within the region. We all have to find a way in which we are going to use less resources, less land, less energy, um, and, and for, for sure, less water. That means that we're going to grow differently in this century than we did in the past century. You have many communities in my state of Colorado as well as in Arizona and other places where you don't have a replenishable, dependable, long-term supply of water. And uh, what's going to happen is at some point in time uh, the rubber is going to hit the road and you're going to see an explosion of uh, controversy because uh, land use planners have not done what they should have done. In the southwest, issues of water use often pit the public good against private landowners. It's very hard to get these folks to recognize that it's actually a regulatory system. So if we can sort of make people understand, perhaps combined with incentives, that if we can protect the quality of life, we can protect flowing streams and habitats, we're actually enhancing their property value and making sure those who are there today actually do have a water supply in the future. That's really what private property rights are. The seven states within the Colorado River watershed must become self-sufficient and less dependent on the river and other depleting water resources. This includes replenishing groundwater basins and aquifers throughout the region, which would provide a safe storage environment for water so it will not be lost through evaporation. By reducing the waste and reusing the water and restoring watersheds, we think that will lead to a more sustainable future. The ultimate aim is to have recycled water be the basic supply source throughout the American Southwest. Treated wastewater should be used in every conceivable way by industry and the agricultural community. Just as some communities within the Southwest are already implementing drinking water reuse projects, water reclamation is the goal. All water is constantly being recycled. The sanitation water that is used, first of all, is generally used for irrigation, um, but it's being treated to a very high level, a uh, very high quality. And so we prefer, instead of calling it toilet to tap, we prefer to call it a showers to flowers. If wastewater is uh, being discharged, view it as a resource, not just a waste stream, and beneficially reuse it. And that can mean taking new steps to discharge water into underground systems to restore and replenish aquifers or future planning for uh, community needs. Also, capturing runoff and stormwater is essential 
in order to generate additional water sources. It's important to have a, a stormwater program that sees stormwater not as a waste stream but as a resource uh, to try to capture that stormwater and uh, put it to good use, beneficial use to nurture the watershed and to keep it healthy. Desalination is a supply option that is available but expensive. Desalination is another option available to us. It's a, it's a technology that makes water we couldn't previously use because it was too salty useful. Uh, I think we're going to see more desalination, but I think we need to be careful about either having too high hopes for it. Uh, I think we need to be careful about thinking it's the silver bullet. And I think we need to be careful about the economic and environmental implications of desalination. We don't think desal is the magic solution for everything. Uh, we think it might be part of the big picture that we need to develop. Figuring out how to suck in large volumes of ocean water without having a serious impact on the biological productivity of, of the oceans is part of the challenge. The other challenge is we desalinate water and we produce two things. We produce very, very fresh water and we produce very, very salty water, a little bit of brine, we call it. We have to figure out how to dispose of that brine in an environmentally acceptable way. Even though there are serious challenges to be overcome, scientists and engineers could combine their creative resources to mitigate the environmental impact of desalination technology. To produce desalination from ocean water requires a tremendous amount of energy. The power generation required for desal can also come from other new sources as well, namely uh, solar generation. There's a lot of land area in the high desert uh, that's open and ready to put in solar panels. Also, there are partnership possibilities regarding desalination exchange benefits between Southern California and other cities and states within the Colorado River watershed. Southern California takes a lot of water from the Colorado River uh, and uh, you could build desal on the ocean in Southern California and via exchange uh, you could uh, let the benefits of that desalinization go to Las Vegas, go to Phoenix, Tucson, uh, movement up the river even in the upper basin it's conceivable that Denver, Salt Lake City, cities which take Colorado River water could benefit from desal. The earth is a spiritual presence that must be honored, not mastered. The planet is sick. There are no emergency rooms for sick planets. The world is looking to the United States to be the leader uh, so that we will put in place the preventative health care plan for the planet that will eliminate or reduce dramatically uh, these catastrophic events from ever occurring. Because once they occur, it will be very difficult for, for our planet to recover from. Water conservation, which includes rainwater harvesting and landscaping, which requires little or no irrigation, as well as the development of efficient appliances and green construction materials, all new homes, corporate and business building, office parks and shopping centers must reflect this new ethic. All other issues in history will be merely a footnote if we do not solve this problem by putting in place the prevention measures that avoids the catastrophic events that will happen if we don't protect our air, our water, our land. 
let's take something very simple. It rains, I turn my sprinkler clock off. I go to brush my teeth, I turn the water off. Those have to become automatic and not consciously thought through tasks. In every aspect of our lives, there are opportunities to respect and save this sacred resource. Small changes in our daily habits can potentially have a dramatic effect. An ethic of conservation throughout the American Southwest is a fundamental requirement, and the effort begins with education. They are their greatest asset. How do you make people assume responsibility for the community they live in? How do you make them recognize that they're a part of the solution? Conservation is the key word. My mother always said, you have to learn how to work smarter, not harder. And if we can do that, we can live just as well. We won't have to sacrifice, but we won't be consuming as much water, as much oil, gas, coal, all resources. And the key step in reducing the wasting of water is instilling an ethic of efficiency and conservation so that people see water as the lifeblood, the, the greatest resource, America's greatest liquid asset. Well, I, I think what we're hearing from our elders is that all is not lost that each person has the power to make changes, that, that it's individual power that will hopefully lead to collective power that will turn the tide. And so in terms of the water crisis, if we all invest into what we hope the future will be like, I think it can be done. A few compassionate, concerned people can make an immense difference for all humanity. I hope you're one of those few. We now have a critical historical obligation to avert the emerging water crisis. Search your mind and heart and ask yourself, how can I help and make a difference? We need to act locally and think globally. Let's be sisters and brothers to all our neighbors and to the world and set an example for all to heed. We're all citizens of the global community and custodians of maintaining the planet's ecological integrity. Our individual responsibility must be to pass along to our children, grandchildren, and all future generations a new, healthy, safe world for all to live and flourish. The time to commence your effort is now. Grandfather, Great Spirit, Fill us with the light. Give us the strength to understand and the eyes to see. Teach us to walk the soft earth as relatives to all that live.